Hello everyone and welcome to episode 2, I suppose we call it this, of the of Daily Cannon's Tactics Board. I, Stephen Bradley, review after a game has been played just to show the, 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 the highlights, the tactical tweaks that were made during a game that helped Arsenal either win or lose a certain fixture. This week we were given the joyous privilege of watching Newcastle play Arsenal on prime time on a Saturday evening where we're all expecting an, an exciting, an enticing, entertaining, breathtaking affair. And oh boy, did we get all of that. Weren't we just treated to a wonderful spectacle of football? My God, it was awful. But there are certain parts of the game that do lend itself to criticism and critique and can show us where Arsenal can go forward from here and maybe what players aren't going to figure maybe in the long-term future of this football club but first I need to start off by thanking you because obviously this is the second episode the first one with the game against West Brom the finish that we won 4-0 last week got 595 views and five likes which um thanks <laughs> we weren't expecting su such a response at all even even one comment which was popular and i can confirm like my lawyers can confirm that uh this wasn't a paid actor like <laughs> but uh no seriously thank you the, the the response and you know it seems as if a lot of you watched it and enjoyed it so thank you so yes this is the cringy part of the video where we say like comment and subscribe for more content and yes if you do like and subscribe and, and watch it we you know i will endeavor to make these after every game it, that's the plan but you know just seeing so many people you know day one go yeah this looks good i'm gonna watch this but thank you uh you know from, you know encouragement to do more and all you know all we can thank you for that you know you, you took your time to to watch this this ugly mug and, and that ugly mug you know you should go go talk about football for 20 minutes and, and not be bored so thank you and speaking of 20 minutes and not be bored about football this was this was 105 minutes of, of being bored and watching football and then two goals in the second part of extra time Arsenal getting a 2-0 win that they were slightly fortunate to get, considering in the 90 minutes of play, Newcastle had the two best chances of the game, and if Bert Leno wasn't so alert, especially in the last minute of normal time, after spending you know 89 minutes sitting on his deck chair, coming out smothering Andy Carroll's shot, Arsenal wouldn't be in the fourth round of the FA Cup. So, all the talk of rotating goalkeepers, Leno needs to be played every game, because nobody trusts Runarsson, and keeping him happy and keeping him in form might be... Arsenal's best chance of winning something this year because if this man here goes <laughs> no, no, nobody really trusts his number two at the moment and there's no number three to talk about so it's going to be interesting to see how much Leno plays over the next month or two because ideally it'll be every game but the 20 million that was you know pocketed for Emmy Martinez to Aston Villa in the summer might go a, a long way to replenishing the funds next summer considering we just took 120 million of a loan out so maybe maybe we can't be picky but this game was as i said at the start of the video this game was illuminating for a couple of reasons M mostly negative couple of positive but the first one is just the team he picked this team as it lines out here if you had said fixture one against fulham that he was going to pick. I know Mary wasn't fit. But if he'd picked Tierney, Mary, Louise, Cedric. Because Bellerin was in and out of form at that stage. And a couple of people were wondering whether he wasn't going to get his yard of pace back. That was so crucial to his game. Guilty as charged. Cedric had been an okay you know, reserve right back. He was going to fit in there. No one wanted to pick Xhaka, so and then he, most people wanted to give Joe Willick a shot, so there he was. William was the brand new signing that a lot of us thought was going to fit in at least well, not seamlessly. We didn't think he was going to be integral to the team, but he was a rather good servant for Chelsea. He, he played really well, and at least he was going to fit in maybe at right wing because if Pepe hadn't, you know, if Pepe didn't get to the barnstorming start, we thought he was going to get that he ended up not getting. William could fit in there. Maybe William could fit in left wing occasionally. And 
Nelson would be the only one that you would say wasn't going to be, quote unquote, in the starting 11 just because of Saka's emergence as an absolute nailed on into the first team presence. So you could probably put Saka there because he was playing left wing a lot at the, at the end of last season. But that 11 three months ago would have been a Premier League 11 that wouldn't have met with too much consternation with the general fan base because it's like, okay, we know some of the players at the club aren't good enough, but there's a chance this team might be. I think we can say safely after tonight's performance that at least one of those players shouldn't be anywhere near Arsenal starting 11 for quite a while and that three or four might be closely behind me but closely behind that might be a little bit harsh but this was this was a chance for at least the midfield five we'll call them, to stake a name in the team sheet as I want to be picked I need to be in the 11 I can make a difference after the emergence of Emile Smith Rowe Saka Martinelli over the last couple of weeks this was a chance for those who had been dropped to go actually excuse me I'm really good I deserve to get into the team it didn't happen. It just did. And it was weird because after the first couple of minutes, Arsenal started brightly. Nelson made a run behind the, behind the back line. Pepe found him. Nelson cuts back, gets a good shot in. Next sec, next about 60 seconds later, Pepe gets a ball on the right wing, cuts inside, hits a shot. And you're like, okay, they're being positive. They're, they're getting on the ball. They're trying to you know, create a threat from outside outside the box so that, you know, trying to draw the defence out so they can run behind. Makes sense. But they did. And the whole pattern of the first half was was two things. One, the way Arsenal set up to attack when they had possession of the ball wasn't 4-2-3-1, as you see here. It was, for all intents and purposes, the City template, which is 4-1-2-3. With the fullbacks providing the width and the wingers just sitting inside in little in between in trying to get down these channels per se. And then number nine being the number nine running down through here. It's the city way. And it requires two things. More than anything to work. It requires two things. The first thing is your left winger and your right winger absolutely have to make this run. Again and again and again and again and again and again and again. They can't stop running. And the reason why they can't stop making those runs behind, and if you think of City attacking, think of the absurd amount of cut-ins for goals because the forward runs in there, the fullback gets it, fullback or the winger gets in there, cut back, tap in goal. They're able to get that again and again because of these two. Now for City obviously it was at least up to the last season Kevin De Bruyne and David Silva who are unbelievable at progressive passes getting the balls from here through the midfield in those channels so that the the, the wingers have something to run on David, Kevin De Bruyne is brilliant at it David Silva was brilliant at it when Guardiola was at Barcelona same setup Xavi was brilliant at it Iniesta was brilliant at it when he was at Barcelona Xavi Alonso was brilliant at it. Thiago was brilliant at it. Joshua Kimmich is now brilliant at it. Philip Lamb, when he was playing centre defensive midfield for a year, was brilliant at it. Like they had so many players that were able to find the balls down here, down there, down there, down there. Even the even the centre backs down there, down there, finding the runs of either the overlapping full backs or the underlapping wingers, getting behind the lines and making the room. Happened again, and again, and again didn't happen it didn't happen because <sighs> this isn't Xavi and this isn't Iniesta this isn't De Bruyne and this isn't David Silva and the... <sighs> you're, you're probably looking at me and going say well, that's a little bit unfair you can't you can't say that but you're going to play centre midfield for a Mikel Arteta side good god you've got to be good on the ball you have to have that passing ability to be able to find those those passes otherwise the the attack stalls and even if this was Kevin De Bruyne and this was David Silva. If Pepe doesn't run there and Nelson doesn't run there, then there's nowhere to pass the ball to. It's just Aubameyang running the channels and against Newcastle's three centre-backs, 
he's maybe going to get one run, maybe two a game where it happens. And he's got to take full full advantage of that. And he did have two in this game. And he took on one really good shot and he skewed the second one wide. But that was it. Whilst Arsenal were playing in this setup. And the only person who really got anything out of this was Tierney. But that's because right now you could have seven right backs on Tierney right now and he still get past all of them because he's playing so well. But whilst Arsenal were trying to play like this, the ball would continue to get to Willock. And if I show you where Willock's, Willock constantly had the ball there. There. He's playing centre mid for Arsenal in a side that doesn't play a cam and his average position where he has the ball is there. Joe Willick is a player that thrives on doing this. Like he's he's like a poor man's Aaron Ramsey. He's off the ball movement is brilliant, but when he's got the ball, he's not the best. And as a result, it's it's a bad fit for a side that's relying on these players here to be passers of the ball and these players here to be runners. That one of your midfielder is also a runner doesn't fit when they're playing four two th this four one two three. And then if Willick goes here and say and then he goes there, he's then not good enough to you know beat a defender off the dribble to make space. He's good at finding space, but then isn't able to to provide that spark in the middle the best asset is doing this he has he's a midfielder with a striker's instincts but not a striker's ability to score so it, 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 it's, it's a weird mishmash of skills that he has he's a good player but right now it's hard to say what his best position is because he's not a good he's not a good passer of the ball to play 10 He's a very good runner, but he's not defensively capable enough to play eight. He's certainly not a four. He's not a wing. He's not a striker. He's just a good player. It's just he needs to kick on, but he needs time. He need you know he needs to be playing that position for a good year, maybe more, to find to, to find that ability in him to learn how to play as a ten or either that or. Go somewhere where he can play eight for a year, a year and a bit, and not be shoehorned in position, you know, willy nilly by a, by a manager that wants to risk someone who's better than him in a certain position. He needs game time. He needs a loan. Badly, badly needs a loan. Willian. I mean, Willian, Nelson, and Pepe are in in essence the same player. And. I'll show you how. Take Pepe. Remember how I was talking about how this team needs runners doing this? Right? And Aubameyang was doing it. Nelson wasn't. But Pepe is the Pepe is a, the, the best illustration of the problem that he causes when he doesn't do what you need him to do. There's his heat map. Now, as you can see, his main spot of the ball, his main spot of retention of the ball is there, which is here. I don't want Pepe there. I want Pepe there. But his style of play, the way he receives the ball, the way he looks for the ball, the runs he makes, means that he gets the ball here. As you can see, some, he's sometimes there, sometimes there, but he's picking up the ball here and moving there with the ball. So he's getting the ball here, or here even, and doing this. He's doing this with the ball. He's going in this direction, moving that way. The goal's here! And he's going that way. And then, like, when, even if Joe Willick does look up, He's seeing a man call for the ball here so that he can run backwards with it. Yes, he might beat Dumas and then yes, he might beat Clark and then he's in a position to take a shot. But he has to beat these two first. And if he beats Dumas, gets past him, he gets to Clark, does a move, tries to get past him. By the time that's that, Dumas back again because he's recovered. 
So for this to work, it requires Pepe to beat two men and then hope that the the defence comes over this way to give them a hand and then for Nelson to make that run so that he can put the ball over the top. Nelson made that run once. Sorry, twice. But that's it. He needs to be doing it 20 times for it to work. And it's that lack of movement up front that just stifled Arsenal again and again and again because what happened... After about 15 minutes of the ball just recycling from Willock to Pepe, Pepe cutting in, going to a Bamiang, going back to Willian who would get in here occasionally, try to beat a man, not beat a man, go to give the ball to Nelson. Tierney would be here by now, waiting for the ball. It would go to Tierney, Tierney might get a cross in. If he doesn't, it goes back to Nelson, it then goes back to Willian, and ball would recycle again and again. But because there were no runs in behind, Newcastle did what any defence would do. They just started moving forward. Slowly but surely during the half, they pushed up, they pushed up, they pushed up, they pushed up. Why? Because it does not matter how quick your front three is. If it doesn't run behind, the back five, as Newcastle set up, aren't going to worry about the space behind them because they know no one's going to run into it. So they just pushed up. And as a result, look at Newcastle's centre back line. 17, 14, 16, 2, 3, their back line. Look how high up the pitch it is. And then their midfield is so narrow. What they were able to do to Arsenal as the match went on, they were able to compress the game into what, in essence, they're able to do this. Aiden goes here. Clark goes here. Bamiang and no. They were able to do that. They were able to make sure that the, the, the whole of the game was played. In this part of the pitch. And you can do nothing. They, they squeezed. They punished Arsenal for not running in behind them. And made sure that one when Pepe ran inside. He was running into Hendrik and Lonstaff. And then Clark. And it was just rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat for an hour of the same mistake being made over and over again. Ball go back, ball go forward, ball go back, ball go forward. And Arteta, to his credit, saw this after 10 minutes of the second half and went, right, I'm going to have to change this. And he made some substitutions and they worked in piecemeal. They did it, it wasn't a complete change of the game. What I did was it slowly reverted Arsenal from this formation, from this style of play, which wasn't working at all, into the style of play that he'd been playing against Brighton, against West Brom a couple of weeks ago that was working. So, first change. He takes off Nelson. And he brings on Smith Rowe. And first thing that happens, William goes there, Smith Rowe goes there, and then he pushes up. Bamian, oh, Hendrik. Hendrik didn't move. Hendrik, Hendrik had a good game, but he didn't move. And Arsenal immediately went back to 4-2-3-1. Just to get an extra runner to push Newcastle back, to give a little bit of space for William and Pepe to maybe beat one defender and go in. But William was having a really poor game, Pepe not much better. So Arsenal made another change. They, they brought on Saka for William, but perhaps more importantly, they took off Willock and brought on Jack. And the change was it was remarkable because what happened was suddenly players were playing with a lot more freedom and a lot more urgency and a lot more impetus why well because this man does not stop running this man 
although Longstaff, Longstaff and Smithrow would have an altercation later on, but Smithrow also doesn't stop r running. And now in Xhaka, yes, he has his limitations, but he can find that pass down there. He can find the pass from to midfield. He is very able to find runners. And as a result, Arsenal started chipping away at Newcastle's defence. And Newcastle's defence, which was, at one point, pushing way forward, was now deep in its own back in its own half. Like Almiron was pinned back to here, Henrik was pinned back to here, Jolinton was taken off for uh do, 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 do. Jolinton was yeah, Jolinton was taken off for, for DeAndre Led Yedlin, a right back. Like at one stage you were playing two right backs down here because of the damage that was being done by Smith Rowe's running going that way. In fact, Smith Rowe got <laughs> when Smith Rowe in the last minute fouled fouled uh Longstaff they were here like it's one of those situations where Arsenal were now playing to their strengths again because there was so much more running done Mary and Louise who before Xhaka came on were two Arsenal's best progressive passes of the ball weren't able to use that to any great effect because no one was running now because Saka was running at will down any channel he could find because Tierney was now helping overload David Luiz's long ball here was working and it just enabled Arsenal just to free everything up a little bit but perhaps and I can't believe I'm saying this but the biggest change was made with 15 minutes to go it was our good friend Lacazette who I have been saying For the best part of three months, that his best position is as a number nine, but he is a poacher's number nine. He needs to be in the box. He needs to be doing this. He needs to be doing that. He needs to be, you know, driving into the box with the ball. He needs to be making sure that his, when he gets the ball, that he's facing towards the goal and not away from the goal and coming back. Yet, with this front four, with Aubameyang running in the channels and Smith Rowe offering, you know, as a as a decoy half the time and as a plan B the other half of the time, and with Xhaka in this kind of form where he's able to find the long balls to find Tierney down one wing and occasionally Cedric down the other, and then Saka again filling in spaces and also, you know, getting in behind the lines. You need a number nine to gel it all together to be able to be able to come deep and draw a Laskell and a Hayden and a Clark with him so that space is made at the behind and Lacazette for the last month has been bloody brilliant at it and the same happened here again because the goal the first goal comes apart comes across from Saka being on the left wing Bamiang running through the middle Smith Rowe and like I said, pressing Clark. Clark miscontrolling it. Smith Rowe getting the ball to Lacazette. Lacazette headers it back to Smith Rowe. Smith Rowe's in and he scores. And it was coming. But it's only because Arsenal maintained the pressure. It was only because instead of waiting for the ball on the right wing and the left wing, Arsenal were much more positive. They were much more on the front foot. They were much more able to push Newcastle back, to make sure that their only real outlet of the ball was a big long hoof up to Andy Carroll, who was doing everything in his power to use his, his huge wingspan and his huge frame to cause trouble and knock the ball down for Almiron or Joe Linton or, or Yedlin or whoever was running or, or Dwight Gale who came on for, actually Dwight Gale came on for Carroll at the end because Carroll was out of, out of energy. But that was Newcastle's game. Get the ball as quickly up front and just hope to run onto knockdowns. Arsenal tried a plan A and it didn't work, but had a plan B that did. And as a result, will probably find themselves using this plan maybe a lot more and these players maybe a lot more than they would have anticipated a month ago. And... It's going to be very interesting to see Arsenal's next lineup because William did nothing, nothing 
to ingratiate himself to deserve getting picked again for the next couple of games. And then he wasn't much better. Willock wasn't much better. Nelson was okay. It's his first game back from injury. Maybe you make an allowance for him. But this team, as it's set up on screen now, with the addition of Bellerin and most certainly with the addition of Thomas Partey instead of Elneny, is dangerous. It's very dangerous. And it now needs to be encouraged. It now needs time. It now needs time to work out the foibles. It now needs time for Aubameyang and Smith Rowe to get on the same wavelength that Saka and Tierney were on and that Lacazette and Smith Rowe clearly seem to be on as proved for this goal and as proved for the West Brom goal a couple of weeks ago or last week I should say but you know it's 2021 weeks feel like months this day this team has a chance this team as it's as it's set out right now with maybe a better centre back and a better centre midfielder has a chance of doing something the team that was picked at the start of the game doesn't. And if you're in that first 11, especially in the midfield, you might be waiting a little while for another chance. Thanks for everyone for watching this episode of Daily Cannon's Tactics Board. I've been Stephen Bradley. If you have enjoyed the video, please remember to like, comment and subscribe, even if it's just telling me how awful this jumper is. It's five years old. I probably need a new one, but anyway. Thanks for watching. Cheers.